I'll go ahead and say it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you very much for attending the first ever in the history of Guam political year-end review. And I, I, I say that in all honesty, because in all the years I've lived here, there has never been a year-end review of the government of Guam and its administration and operation. And it's no surprising to me, I know that this is kind of washed out, but uh, it's not surprising that there are not as many people here as I would have expected. But I understand, because we live in a climate of fear. We have a population on this island that is being held economic hostage. Everybody is afraid of losing their job because there's a shortage of jobs. So people are very, very cautious. And politicians take advantage of that. But the one thing that politicians can't do is they can't see who we select when the time comes to go into the voting booth. So I would like to start out with the moral hazard of politics. And this is where we as citizens are at a disadvantage because we listen to what politicians say, we give them the benefit of the doubt, and then we give them our vote. And when we give them our vote, they get into office and they get put their friends and supporters into positions of power and they do whatever they want to do because there's no risk to them. Politicians get into office, they make a lot of promises to us, the voters, to give them our precious vote that gives them the power and authority to act and spend in our name. So it's a year into a new administration and a new legislature, so let's take a look at how they did. Now, a lot of people may have no remembered that I've been fairly negative on the Leon Guerrero Tenorio administration through the campaigns. And the reason why was I looked at who was running the campaign and the types of people they were surrounding themselves with. Because on the campaign trail, they claimed they were going to make health care their number one um, issue, followed by crime and drugs roads and education. But based on what has happened over the past year, their real priorities are raising taxes, opening the door for expanding gambling, pay raises for insiders, fest pack, and decolonization. So let's go back and look at the people that the governor's office surrounded themselves with because my mentor told me you judge a leader by the quality of the people they surround themselves with. My first concern when they announced the team was Tom Atta was co-chair of the campaign. And the reason I had concerns with this is between 2015, 2016, 2017, and 2018, 2017, I had a lot of issues with Guam YTK. I was fighting to prevent the government of Guam taking somewhere between 15 and 20 million taxpayer dollars and handing them to a company that didn't do anything, that it contracted to do, didn't pay any rent, and didn't build a fish plant, didn't build a fishing industry, didn't hire 35 people, yet somehow they felt they were owed 14 to 20 million dollars. Tom Ada and I fought over this because it, it was his impression and his belief that the taxpayers of Guam owed Guam YTK that money. We had another battle over GRRP, Guam Resource Recovery Partners. They were suing the taxpayers of Guam for $20 million because they failed to build a waste energy plant because it was against the law. And Tom Adda's position at that time was the taxpayers of Guam owe Guam YTK $20 million, and we're lucky if that's all we have to pay them because if they take us to court, we could end up owing them hundreds of millions of dollars. Well... As we have seen, because the citizens stood up, 
Guam YTK fell by the wayside, and GRRP is falling by the wayside, but it's still in court. And this is what's really interesting. It doesn't exist. There's no corporate charter, no business license, no filings with Department of Public Works and Re or uh, Department of Revenue and Taxation. Uh, the partnership that formed Guam Resource Recovery Partner in Delaware was terminated when waste management pulled out. You can't have a partnership with only one partner. So when waste management pulled out, GRRP ceased to exist. But yet, here in the Superior Court of Guam, they have an active lawsuit against the taxpayers of Guam for $20 million. And they want $20 million or they want exclusive rights on a $360 million bond guaranteed by taxpayers for a company who has never designed and built a waste energy plant to design and build a waste energy plant and have taxpayers pay for everything. So that was why I was concerned. Pardon me? Uh, Guam YTK was a company that had a lease on Hotel Wharf back in the 90s, and I mean uh, early 2000. They were going to build a fish plant, but they never did. They never paid their lease rent. They owe something like $2 million in lease rent. And when the lease was terminated, three attorneys got together and said, oh, the termination was improper. Even though they didn't complete the requirements of the contract, even though they, they didn't pay any taxes, even though they didn't uh, make any payments, the taxpayers of Guam owe them $14 million plus interest plus attorney's fees. Fortunately, the Supreme Court of Guam felt otherwise, and the Guam YTK case was settled in favor of taxpayers. But it was only after uh, taxpayers stood up and raised a lot of concerns that uh, this case started to slow down. But Tom Atta was one of the champions on Guam YTK. He was one of the champions on a GRRP. So that's why I was concerned that he was the co-chair of this campaign. And my fears were magnified when the other co-chair was Francis Santos. Francis Santos and Tom Matta back in the 90s put together a pork barrel bill that gave special benefits to Bank of Guam. And it was overturned in the Supreme Court of Guam. But the fact that they have a track record of favoring pork barrel projects was one of the reasons why I was concerned. The other reason why I was concerned is Tony Babauta is the chief of staff. And he was the chief of staff during the campaign as well. And he was terminated from the Interior Department for transgressions. And so now we have three people at the top of this campaign that have, in the past, supported pork barrel operations. And that was my concern. Because when you judge the quality of a leader, you look at the type of people they surround themselves with. And in order for to do this, we have to look at the team as a whole. Now let's start with Rory Respicio. He was one of the uh, campaign, he was one of the team chief, the campaign team leaders. They put him into commercial port. And rather than start at step one, like every other port director before them, starting at about the $85,000 level, he put himself in at $170,000. He put himself all the way in the top step. So here we have a man who has never run a business, never run a port, yet he comes in and gets right at the top at $170,000 a year with no experience. And in the process, he starts negotiating in the background to settle the Guam YTK for somewhere to seven to $10 million before the court decision comes out. So he is actively working 
for the benefit of the owners of Guam YTK trying to reach an out-of-court settlement before the Supreme Court made their decision based on the case. And if any, yeah. Okay, I don't want to get into the history of Guam YTK because we'd be going back to 1996. I'm saying that my concern on this administration, this campaign, is that the co-chairs and in the concerns I had about Tom Atta is his adamant support for giving tens of millions of dollars of taxpayers' money to dubious um, pork barrel projects. That's where I want to set it because I, I mean, if you want to look at Guam YTK, I got a 45 minute video posted that goes back through the history. But what we're looking at is we came into 2019 full of hope. The hope was based on promises that were made to us, but we have to look at the types of people that are executing the promises. Transparency in government was one of the promises. Accountability was one of the promises. And reduce the cost of governmental operations. And right off the bat, within the first month, we had the Port Authority uh, general manager trying to settle out a court between seven and ten million dollars. And it was a, I mean, it was a rush job because it was a very bad, it was a very strong case for the people. And as we saw, the Guam Supreme Court found for the people. Then we go back to the head of the Guam National Guard who tried to sneak a $41,000 pay raise, a 50% increase in pay raise. She tried to sneak it through without anybody noticing. But unfortunately, somebody noticed it. So now we have another situation where Tom Atta, he started at the airport as the head. Now, when Chuck Atta was head of the airport, he started at step one at $86,000 a year and over eight years and eight uh, performance evaluations went from 86,000 to 143 when he left office. Tom Adam moved in and his first act was to give himself a $12,000 pay raise. So this goes back to the types of leaders that are being put into positions of power and authority based on the votes that we gave the administration. Mayor's Council of Guam, Angel Sablon, at a time when the government is strapped, trying very hard to make its bills and expenses, literally robbing Peter to pay Paul, uh, the Mayor's Council of Guam, executive director, basically gave himself a $22,000 a year pay raise on top of a $30,000 a year pay raise. So basically he went from $46,000 in 2017 to $100,000 a year in 2019. So what really makes this interesting is the Mayor's Council of Guam recently came out trying to get a 30 cent an hour pay raise for the maintenance workers that work for all the different mayor's office. This is after the mayors themselves got a pay raise from 45 to 75,000 and the mayor's council executive director got a pay raise from 46 to 100,000, but they feel their maintenance workers deserve a 30 cent an hour pay raise. What we have happening here in government of Guam because we as voters are not paying attention is these boards and commissions of the different government agencies are giving their executive directors large pay raises and bonuses basically in secret. We recently had to file suit against the uh, CCU for giving the executive management team at Guam Power Authority uh, $25,000 pay raises for nothing, for doing the job they were hired to do. You see, what we're having here in Guam is we are paying mainland salaries for small island jobs. For example, the head of Guam Power Authority is getting $250,000 a year, managing 400 employees and 51,000 clients. 
the head of SMUD, Sacramento Municipal Utility, and, oh, Guam Power Authority has no competition. Then you look at SMUD, Sacramento Municipal Utility District. The manager there is getting $300,000. He has a million customers. He has 1,300 employees. And he has competition from uh, PG&E, Consolidated Edison, Nevada Energy, and a couple of other energy companies that are trying to get a share of his business. So here on Guam, with no competition and just a few customers, he's getting almost the same amount of money as a guy that's getting, you know, has nearly a million customers. And it's the same thing. You go to Jacksonville, Florida. The head of the power department there is getting $330,000. He has 1.2 million customers. He has 2,500 employees. And he has competition from eight other power companies like Florida Power and Light, uh, Georgia Pacific, and other big, you know, Fortune 500 level utility companies. So that's why I like a bill that um, Clint Rogel introduced that would require all salaries granted by boards and commissions to go before the legislature, happening in secret because when you look at the published minutes, it's like this, uh, old business, new business, public comment, but there is no information provided what the old business is, what the new business is, so we as voters and citizens and owners of this magnificent company we call Government of Guam are basically left in the dark. And here's another example of what I'm talking about. Recently, Guam Housing and Urban Renewal had a lawsuit filed against it by uh, Ray Tapazna. Now, Ray Tapazna was a former deputy director of Gura and he reported to the U.S. Uh, housing and Urban Renewal some irregularities taking place in government of Guam's Gura. But that was his job. That was what he was hired to do. Now, the fact that he was terminated, he was in an exempt political appointment position. So the governor can terminate him. The boards can terminate him. And he was terminated. But now he comes back and he's filing a lawsuit against the taxpayers of Guam for seven years of back wages, double and triple, plus interest, plus attorney's fees, and he wants his job back. Well, he has his job back. He is the executive director of Gura, but he's still suing Gura and through Gura suing the taxpayers of Guam for about a million dollars suit first came up, I pulled it up and I looked at it. Here's his lawsuit and here's the part right here where he seeks full recovery of federal monies but then down here he wants uh, back pay, compensation, and special damages for his termination. So at the end what we're looking at is he wants um, taxpayers to give him a million dollars. We are in a situation now where the leader prepares for the next generation, a politician prepares for the next election. And this administration has gone out loud and clear that we are preparing for the next election because they've already declared formally that they are going to be running for re-election in 2022. So what this does, it puts everybody on notice that uh, we're still in the game and we are going to be looking after the insiders first. Now I say that because let's look at the promises that were made. The first promise made was to reduce the cost of government. The administration said that on the campaign trail and the senators all said that on the campaign trail. The first thing that happened when they got into power is the director's pay raises across the board, anywhere from one to $10,000. And the governor passed the biggest budget ever. Now we have to put this budget in perspective. 
between 2000 and now, the U.S. Department, the Census Bureau, estimates that the population of Guam for the past 10 years has fluctuated between 159 and 164,000. So basically, there's been a 0% increase in the population. The Guam Department of Labor records show that for the past 10 years, the workforce on Guam has alternated between 62 and 64,000. So for the past 10 years, the, work for, the number of people on Guam working has remained basically the same. At the beginning of the Calvo Tenorio administration, the economy of Guam was $4.7 billion. At the beginning of the Leon Guerrero Tenorio administration, the economy was $5 billion. So over the past eight years, we had a 7% increase in the gross domestic product here on Guam. During the Calvo Tenorio administration, they did do one thing. They reduced the headcount of government of Guam. By, from the beginning of the Calvo Tenorio administration to the beginning of the Leon Guerrero Tenorio administration, government of Guam's headcount went down 23%. So they, I'm going to give them credit for that. But by the same token, the budget for government of Guam has gone from $468 million the first year of the Calvo Tenorio administration to $954 million a 203% increase in the operating cost of government of Guam over nine years. Where did that money come from? It came out of our pockets. Over the past eight years, we've seen over a 30% increase in the cost of living. And what we're also seeing as a result of all the borrowings by government of Guam, the amount of discretionary funding that government of Guam has to keep commitments like repair roads, uh, maintain school buildings has gone down because the debt service has gone up. Government of Guam by itself is spending nearly $100 million a year. One in five tax dollars coming in to government of Guam is going to debt service. When you look at all of government of Guam, the autonomous agencies as well as the non-autonomous agencies. The debt service is two hundred million dollars. So it looks like we're not doing a, a very good job That's for all collecting the GPA bonds, the overdue taxes, bonds, the water real bonds, estate taxes, the, uh, hotel occupancy taxes, the or the business license all for all the illegal BMBs. A year. But what about the but campaign commitment to? That. Roll back the business privilege tax and the 1% tax. The How are we Memorial doing there? Hospital had $20 million of vendor payables. And the legislature passed a, passed a bond bill to raise $45 million to pay $20 million in receivable and use the other money for other things. Well, that... $45 million is going to cost taxpayers $90 million. So we're going to pay 100% in interest and debt service on that $45 million loan. And what we're seeing right now is the administration and the legislature are preparing for the next round of borrowings because they are adamantly trying to raise the property taxes. They're reevaluating all the property. Now, even if they double the property tax, that only goes from 26 million to 52 million. But what it does is it raises the debt limit. When we raise the value of all the properties on Guam, then we raise the limit on the amount of money government of Guam can borrow. And they're talking about a couple of major pork barrel projects that we'll get into in a minute. But as we can see that over the past year, the government has done nothing to reduce the cost of operations. Now, the second claim was that the governor and the legislature were going to collect the taxes due. 
collect all the real estate property taxes that were due, the hotel occupancy taxes due, and all the taxes and uh, business licenses on all the illegal B&Bs on the island. And if we had done that, we wouldn't have had to raise the business privilege tax. How much effort do you think has been put to collecting taxes due? Zero. Well, that's when, let me be fair, they did hire four revenue collection agents. And based on uh, revenue tax statements at the special economic session at the legislature, each new revenue agent will collect between two and three million dollars of taxes. So we have about 200 million outstanding taxes, and we've hired four people that over the next year, after they complete their training, they're still in training, will collect maybe somewhere between eight and 12 million dollars. The public auditor has been highlighting the fact that we are losing millions of dollars a year in cigarette taxes. A lot of suggestions have been put forward on how we can collect that. One of my favorite ones was a proposal that all the taxes on a container be paid by the importer up front and let the importer collect the taxes through sales. But obviously that never got anywhere. So now what we're looking at is the fact that we know that we're somewhere between 60 and 50 million dollars upside down on tax collections. We don't know what the settlement was made. We don't know what the payment schedules were. So we're still in the dark. And as far as we can tell, there are still fraud and abuse taking place in the collection of taxes. So we're not doing such a good job collecting taxes due. How are we doing on the commitment to roll back the business privilege tax and the 1% tax? So, the legislature and the administration both fall short on their, their campaign promises to uh, roll back taxes. Now, I will highlight that only one senator even proposed rolling back the taxes. That's Senator Moylan back there. He made the effort to try to roll back the taxes, but as I recall, his bill never got out of committee. Or if it did get out, it didn't make it. But which is so funny because this administration campaigned on the fact that we didn't need to raise the business privilege tax. If we had just collected taxes owed, we wouldn't have had to go to 5%. We wouldn't have had to raise the tax on buildings a million or more by 1%. And the problem with this is they didn't roll back the tax. And the first law passed by the 35th legislature was to add or more because the law that was passed was flawed. It raised the tax on buildings of a million but not a million or more. So the first law passed by the 35th legislature was to reach deep into our pockets. And I say our pockets. I do not have a house that's worth a million dollars. But I have friends that live in condos and apartment buildings that are worth more than a million dollars. Government agencies are paying rent to owners in buildings that are worth more than a million dollars. So all that money is coming out of our pockets and going right back into the government. So the governor has made it official. It is 5% forever, forever, forever. And the tax on a million or more is also forever. So what we're looking at is the administration made promises to us and the promises would have, over time, helped slow down the rapidly rising cost of living. But that isn't going to happen. And here's why. The head of the uh, Senate Finance Chairman, contrary to his campaign promise to roll back the 5%, made it forever. And we got the fuel tax increase, which is 1% forever. The building tax increase, 1% forever. He passed the biggest budget ever. And as 
the chairman of the finance committee, he made no effort whatsoever to try to reduce the cost of government. I remember when B.J. Cruz was head of the finance committee, and he put those departments through the ringer trying to get them to reduce the cost of government. And I think at the end of two weeks, they reduced it by 10 million. I watched the budget meetings and I didn't see any effort whatsoever by any of the senators or legislatures, save one, James Moylan, to try to reduce the cost. Now, I'm, I'm going to pick on Senator Moylan later. I'm just letting him know that I recognize that even though he's a member of the legislature, he was not able to do the work we sent him there to do because other senators felt it was more important to keep these tax raises in place past the biggest budget ever. And on top of that, much to my dismay, this legislature minimized the minimum wage that they passed. What we did not see in the, in the increase in the minimum wage was a viable increase in minimum wage. 50 cents next year and 50 cents a year from now did not do anything to reduce the cost of living when across the board the food and beverage industry raised prices anywhere from 8 to 30 percent, making it even harder for the people who work in food and beverage to eat in the places they work. The next promise was to fight crime and to make us feel safe. Let's see how they're doing on that regard. A per, how many of you believe a person's actions speak louder than their words? Absolutely. The Guam Police Department just recently completed a study to determine public opinion on the crime-fighting effort. And where do you think they rated? Up or down? Yeah. Yeah, the police survey shows a low level of confidence by the public. And this goes back to what I said at the beginning. Who we have in leadership positions tells us what we can expect from the government. So this story starts with the arrest of a government of Guam employee who was a member of Homeland Security who used the power of his position and the authority of his office to bring meth directly into, he used the power of his position to bring meth in through the Office of Homeland Security, thinking, and probably correctly, that no one was going to check the packages going to Homeland Security. But he got caught. And when he got caught, we had 23 le leaders people in positions of power and authority come rapidly to his defense, starting with the chief of staff for the governor. Now, bear in mind, in 28, 2017, when he wrote the letter, he wasn't chief of staff of the governor, but he was chief of the campaign. And so he knew that he was going to be chief of staff of the governor. But what is interesting to me when he goes to defend a government of Guam employee, a drug dealer who imports meth for money, $5,000 a package, brings the meth into the island, he gets a letter from Tony Babauta who uses his former position in an effort to influence the judge. When he signed himself as former Assistant Secretary for Insular Affairs, U.S. Department of the Interior. This was a blatant effort to use the power of him and prestige of a government office for the benefit of a person who abused the trust that we gave him with the position we put him in. Next is Steve Ignacio, our chief of police. 
Imagine having the chief of police, or at this time he was just a captain, writing a letter to the judge defending and re recommending leniency and pleading for mercy for a drug dealer, a, law a fellow law enforcement official who used the power and prestige of his office to bring meth into the island. And then we had his boss, the head of Homeland Security, the man responsible for protecting us from this drug, war, this drug epidemic. And we have the head of Homeland Security and Civil Defense writing a letter to the judge asking for mercy and leniency for a government employee who used the power and position to bring meth into the island. Then we have the mayor of Dedido, one of the, video, the village's hardest hit by the meth epidemic, pleading for leniency for a meth dealer who used the power and position of his office at the governor's uh, complex, Homeland Security office, to bring in meth. And we have the mayor of Agate, also hit hard by this meth ep epidemic, going to the judge asking for mercy and leniency. Who stood up for the families? Who went to, before the judge and said, based on the actions of this individual and uh, the damage caused, hundreds of families now have family members who are addicted to meth and are now on the downward spiral. And m m over the course of time, you know, families have been destroyed, relationships destroyed beyond repair, and people have died. Who stood up and asked for them? Not the mayor of Agate, not the mayor of, uh, or not the head of uh, Homeland Security, not the chief of police, and certainly not the governor's chief of staff. What we're looking at here is a epidemic. And now we, last year we had the, you know, 10 correction officers, including management, being arrested for dealing meth and and uh, contraband inside the prison. Does that make you feel safe? It shouldn't. And then we have the, governor, the lieutenant governor's sister threatening to kill an informant who was informing on the DOC, you know, the person who was leaking information to the, to the police and the courts, and she threatened to kill this person. Now, if I threatened to kill somebody, what do you think the chances are I'd walk with a parking ticket? See, this is where we're looking at the two levels of justice, one for politically well-connected insiders and one for everybody else. Because here we have a clear example of someone who threatened to kill a government witness and basically was given the equivalent of a parking ticket. She is now chief of staff at Pito Terlahi's office, who is in charge of Public Safety Department of Corrections. How well, how did we feel about having someone who's running around threatening to kill people sitting in a power of position to shape laws? Then we have the Jonia situation with the mayor using his power and authority to bring drugs into the island as well. And his, his uh, story has spread out to involve the court and the police. Going into this year, several times people told me, if you don't stop attacking this administration, they're going to destroy your reputation. I said, how are they going to do that? They told me they're going to arrest you for meth. I said, I don't use meth. I don't have any meth in my system. They said, you will have now, before, I, did, I thought that was a bunch of crap, and I didn't worry about it. But now, I kind of have to worry. Because now we can't trust the people who we have in charge to protect us, to protect us, because they're more concerned about protecting drug dealers. And now we have even the leadership of Department of Corrections resigning because they got tangled in the meth epidemic through the Jonia Mayor's office. We've seen an increase in violent crimes on this island because of meth. 
We've also seen increased home invasions, and we're also seeing increases in crimes across the board. In fact, there was a recent story that out of the 350 people that were processed through the court, 158 were back in for committing felonies while out on a, a bail. So we've got a revolving door where we have people who are being arrested, they're put out on bail, and while they're out on bail, they're committing more felonies. How many of you feel safe now? Do you know how many bills to fight crime have been introduced so far in the 35th legislature? Any ideas? One. And that bill is to lower the qualifications to be chief of police. Now how safe do you feel? You know, we're going to lower the qualifications to be chief of police. That is the only crime bill that moved through the legislature so far this year. So I ask you again, how many of you out there feel safe? All you need to know about an army is look at the qualities and habits of its leaders. Lao Tzu, famous Chinese philosopher. Government of Guam is like an army. Any organization organized for a purpose could be considered an army, right? Well, right off the bat, we know we have problems in the Guam National Guard. We've had multiple letters coming out anonymously. And the reason they come out anonymously is we have a huge climate of fear in this community because we're all economic hostages. Most people working in government of Guam are afraid to stand up because they've got mortgages, they've got kids in school, they've got kids in college, they need their health insurance because they have a chronic disease and they can't afford to lose their jobs. Yeah. And here we have a situation here where one of the leaders, her number one priority was to give herself a pay raise. And in the process, her management style and actions are destroying the unit cohesion and morale at the Guam National Guard. I wish I could say this was an isolated case, but it isn't. Here we even have members of the Guard who are moving out speaking on the same issue. But the same thing happened at Department of Corrections. We were getting anonymous letters from Department of Corrections. And in time, the, the director of Department of Corrections resigned after the deputy director of Corrections resigned. We're getting letters, anonymous letters from the Guam Visitors Bureau. So all across government of Guam, and I'm surprised there hasn't been one from Guam Memorial Hospital because a lot of people from the hospital talk to me, but they're afraid of losing their jobs. We even have the Attorney General with a cryptic message that he acknowledges that some government of Guam officials are under investigation. Does that inspire you with confidence in the leadership that we have put in place with our precious votes? It shouldn't. Because we don't have leaders looking out for the next generation. We have politicians more concerned about the next election. And that's why for decades we've seen deterioration in the quality of government, and that's on us. This election, the senators and the administration all came in promising to make Guam Memorial Hospital their number one priority. The number one reason why I supported Frank Huggan, among others, was that he was the only politician that said, if we are ever going to fix government of Guam and Guam Memorial Hospital, we need to put Guam Memorial Hospital into a receivership, like we did with the landfill. Only the federal government forced the landfill. And Guam Memorial Hospital is being abused in many of the same ways that uh, the landfill was. When I looked at the documentation from the receiver when they first took over, one thing that jumped out is excavation rental, excavator rental. $13,000 a day for two or three years. $13,000 a day. When the receiver they got in, he discovered that the starter motor was bad. 
So he took the starter motor out, had it rewound for $800 and put it back in. And then the government of Guam excavator was running perfectly. So for two and a half years, we spent about $2.4 million a year renting an excavator. These are pork barrel projects. These are the moral hazard decisions we talked about because now we have politicians coming in looking at how they can take care of their loyal insiders first. And we're seeing the same thing happen at Guam Memorial Hospital. I have been doing FOIAs on Guam Memorial Hospital for almost a year. One of the things that caught my attention is Guam Memorial Hospital sent a nurse and a doctor to London twice for $100,000 to take a seminar they could have taken online for $899. So for $98,000 difference, we could have taken that $98,000 and used it to do something more meaningful like mm, fix the elevators, stock the pharmacy at the emergency room, things like this. But instead we used $100,000 basically to send two people on a junket. See, these are the types of decisions that are being made without public scrutiny because Guam Memorial Hospital is an entity of its own. It's just like the landfill. You know, we have doctors who are double and triple billing. We, you know, there's all kinds of things taking place at Guam Memorial Hospital that shouldn't be taking place. And the reason they take place is because politicians look at Guam Memorial as an ATM machine. Here's a $150 million cash flow that goes through this building. How can we carve off a little piece for me? How can we carve off a little piece? Well, how about a 1,000 employees in a building that should only have between 450 and 550 based on U.S. health care standards? How about having two or three people doing the same job at six figures apiece? How about contracts being awarded with no oversight or supervision? See, these are the types of things that take place in these boards and commissions outside of public scrutiny and why if we're ever going to fix Guam Memorial Hospital and do it right, we need to get public servants into office. We'll get into more on that in a second. How many of you remember during the Calvo Tenorio administration, they were beating the drums? We need $6 million for a power panel for GMH or people will start dying. You remember that? I did a FOIA. I wanted a copy of the report documenting the condition of the panel and documenting the RFPs or RFIs, requests for proposals or requests for information where they got that six million figure from. There was nothing. There was no documentation whatsoever. So when the Leon Guerrero Tenorio administration came in and started beating the drum, we need $11 million for a new panel or people are gonna start dying. Remember that? So I did another FOIA and guess what I got? Just a letter from a vendor recommending replacement of the panel. It didn't even have a price. No reports, no studies, no analysis. Just a letter from a vendor. They're pulling these numbers out of somewhere. But they're not pulling them out of reality. Right now the current must have is we need 50 million dollars for electronic health care system or we're gonna lose Medicare and Medicaid funding. So I sent a FOIA. Give me a copy of the RFP, RFI on electronic health care systems so I could see, because that number was high. When I look on the internet and I find other hospitals installing these systems, they're running around 10 to 20 million dollars. So where are they getting this 50 to 100 million dollar figure they keep tossing around? So I sent in the FOIA and I got a letter saying no such documentation or information outlined in your FOIA request exists. Again, they're pulling these numbers out of thin air. 
we had the uh, Army Corps of Engineers come in. Oh, I, I, I'd throw this in at the last minute. A British doctor was treated in an American emergency room and revealed how broken the U.S. health care system is. And I agree with this article and this story, and I'll tell you why. Because one Sunday many years ago when I had health care insurance, I ripped my finger to the bone. I went to Guam Memorial Hospital. I waited seven hours to see a doctor. I had a towel that was blood red by the time I saw the doctor. He flushed it out with saline solution and gave me a tetanus shot and put butterfly bandages. The bill, one thousand, well, it was actually $981. But it was covered by insurance. I had a $100 deductible on emergency room. So I went to my doctor and I said, I got concerns. All he did is flush it out with saline, put Benedictine on it and butterfly bandages. He said, I would have done the same. I said, well, how much would you have charged me? He said, 86 bucks, office visit. You see, that is the problem that we're having here. And the reason we have this problem is because Tina Munya Barnes, the first bill she introduced was Bill 30. With no due diligence, no research, no information whatsoever, she decided that we needed to include Guam Regional Medical Center into any government of Guam insurance plan. It was pure pork. And the way they went about it and did it, it basically made Guam Regional Medical Center a, a department of government of Guam because now Guam Regional Medical Center gets to decide who will bid for government insurance and who won't. It's in the courts. We'll see how it comes out. But this is the legislature approaching health care. It's like monkeys throwing crap at the wall. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't do any research. They don't do any due diligence whatsoever. All they're doing is they're pulling these ideas. And bear in mind, none of them is a health care expert. And I kept pointing out to all these senators what they needed to do is they needed to change the game. What they needed to do is do what Hawaii did in the 70s. In Hawaii in the 1970s, they put in a universal health care program that has resulted in 93% of the residents of Hawaii to this day having health care coverage. State of Hawaii has the lowest increases in health care year after year after year. So on the mainland under Obamacare, where we're seeing health care costs go up by 20 to 30 percent. In 2017, the health care cost in Hawaii went up 8.5 percent. So what we have here is we have a problem. The problem we have here on Guam is that not enough people have health care coverage. And when they don't have health care coverage, they use Guam Memorial Hospital as their primary care provider. In 2017, we had all these uh, doctors, I don't know if you remember the hearse parked out in front of the legislature. We had all these doctors coming through testifying on health care. But one thing that came clear is 75% of the patients coming through the emergency room at Guam Memorial Hospital do not have adequate health care or have no health care. 75%. And then you look at the outpatient work, 5,300 outpatient clients, 17,000 emergency room visits. That confirms that people are waiting until they are sick enough to go to the emergency room because they don't have health care. That is the problem that our legislators should be addressing because that's an easier problem to solve than trying to slice and dice benefits because we have one senator that wants colonoscopies covered 100%. We have another senator that wants mammograms. You know, all these senators are putting in their favorite benefit, but they're not looking at the package as a whole. And that's the problem with our health care. We have people who know nothing about health care trying to create a health care system 
for people and in the process trying to carve out little chunks of it for the politically well-connected insiders. Bill 30 was the second bill that passed in this legislature. The first bill was the or more, raising the taxes on buildings. The second was Bill 30, which basically raised the cost of health care dramatically here on Guam. In 2018, the cost of the single provider would have been $21 million cheaper than the multi-vendor. But the administration, the Calvo Tenorio administration, went with the multi-vendor because, I don't know, maybe they're one of the multi-vendors. But that's water under the bridge. So then BJ passed the law restricting it to the best cost provider. But with Bill 30, we now brought in one of the highest cost providers as a mandatory benefit. And in the process, health care went up another $10 million over 2018. So 2018 was $21 million more than 2017's proposal. And now 2020's proposal is $10 million more than the 2017 proposal. A total increase coming out of taxpayers' pockets of $31 million. But when you listen to the people talking, they're not happy with the health care. It's, it's one of the topics that gets brought up to me most often when I'm meeting with people one-on-one, -on -one, how unhappy they are with the health care plan they have now. And I'm thinking, well, my God, you know, I don't have any health care plan. I'd be happy with a health care plan, Bear, along with 75% of the other people on Guam. So until we get a legislature of public servants, people who are willing to do the hard work for the benefit of the people of Guam rather than for the benefit of politically well-connected insiders in the next election, things are not going to get better. They're going to get a lot worse. As a result of Bill 30, instead of having one hospital on life support supported by taxpayers, we now have two hospitals on life support being supported by taxpayers. And the problem is, Taxpayers are running out of money. Now, this is a battle I fought before. I fought it with Simon Sanchez, and I now have a lawsuit against Bill 30 in the Department of Administration, and it's in the courts right now, and I think I've got a really good chance at winning. And if we do, then that will break the mold of creating legislation for the benefit of politically well-connected insiders. Because that's all Bill 30 was. The, I call it the GRMC Corporate Welfare Bill. Uh, basically, in my lawsuit, I'm saying the government of Guam gave away its power to another entity to make decisions for the benefit of the taxpayers of Guam, and we have no oversight on them like we do on the legislature, like we do on the administration. Because if we don't like their decisions in theory, we can vote them out or we can recall them or maybe do something like this. So I filed a taxpayer lawsuit and we're in the court now. I believe my next hearing is the 27th of this month. Stay tuned. Uh, the Attorney General's office is opposing me on this. And according to the Attorney General, as a taxpayer on Guam, I have no standing. You see, the government is very quick to limit the power of the people, but only if we let it. That's why I'm pursuing this in the court. Now, this leads us to the GMH construction pork barrel. We all saw what happened when Simon Sanchez was proposed. When I looked at the bill for Simon Sanchez, I found three glaring omissions. The first one was there was no cap on this bill. Whoever got awarded a contract under this bill could ring the cash register as long as government of Guam had money in the general fund. Just imagine having a credit card with no limit. That's what this bill did. The second thing was 
this bill did not require performance bonds and did not require the government of Guam be the payee or the beneficiary of any performance bonds. The third thing this bill didn't have was a requirement that people who bidded actually knew what they were doing. So I tried to get Judy Wanpat to introduce legislation correcting these problems before the contracts were awarded. She refused. She went so far as to send a letter to the Attorney General's office to get a legal opinion on why she didn't have to introduce legislation that was brought up by a taxpayer or a resident or a voter. And the Attorney General complied. They issued a warning saying, you don't have to listen to Leon Guerrero. But you notice the letter didn't say? It didn't say, cap that budget. What's the matter with you? Require bonding. Make sure government of Guam is the beneficiary of the bonding. And for God's sakes, make sure anybody that picks up a packet is qualified to build a, a uh, multi-purpose, large public use building. What happened? The contract went to a mixed martial arts firm that had been in existence for 18 months, and their purpose was to promote martial arts contests in the Philippines. Do you feel safe sending your children to a school built by that company? No hands. Not surprised. I mean, we even got emails as part of the discovery where they were talking about how they could run this up to $160 million, and no one would know because there's no legislative oversight on this bill once the contract signed. Pork barrel projects are where well, politically well-connected insiders look at how they can reach into our pockets, and the only way that happens is when we let them, when we let things like this stand, which brings me back to Guam Memorial Hospital. The Army Corps of Engineers came out and did a study of Guam Memorial Hospital. They did a study on the uh, London LBJ Hospital in American Samoa as well. Both are 150-bed hospitals. Both buildings were constructed in the 70s. Both suffered primarily poor maintenance. And as a result, the Army Corps says to bring Samoa up to code, is going to cost around 175 million. To replace it, it will cost about 700 million dollars. We've already been hearing the talking points coming out of different people in the administration about the need to build a new Guam Memorial Hospital and we'll put it over by the University of Guam so we can make it a teaching hospital. You know, they're already floating the talking points because someone wants a $700 contract that will be paid for by you and me. See, until we start electing public servants into positions of power in the legislature and the administration, we're never gonna solve the health care problem. Guam Memorial Hospital will continue to bleed money like it has bled money every year. Now look at the landfill. For 30 years, the administration fought EPA for the right to keep running the landfill the way they always were. Why? It's a pork barrel. It's an ATM. We have the same fight taking place. Remember, Governor Leon Grove is going to appoint competent management to lead Guam Memorial Hospital out of the situation where we are now. So when we look at Queens Medical Center, they hired a guy that had 17 years experience managing hospitals for the United States Air Force and the Department of Defense. They're paying him $600,000. We're paying three people at Guam Memorial Hospital $250,000 apiece, and none of them have ever run a hospital before in their lives. So we're paying $750,000 for someone to run a 150-bed hospital. Hawaii is paying $600,000 for someone to run a 1,000-bed hospital with 1,000 doctors on staff. We have, I think, 43 doctors on staff. So it goes back to, again, we are paying big city prices for small town jobs. And that doesn't change until we, as voters, change. We have to look at those running for office differently. 
so we can scratch off the commitment to make Guam Memorial their number one priority. They all testified without exception that they were going to bring down the cost of living here on Guam. How are they doing? Well, like I said, this past year, uh, all the menus in restaurants have gone up anywhere from 13 to 30 percent. So the people who are live, working in those restaurants are having trouble eating in those restaurants. We're talking about the Alice people, asset limited, income constrained, but employed, the working poor. The people here on Guam, 63 percent of them work in low wage service sector jobs because that's the economy we have. The hotels, the restaurants, and the affiliated businesses, tourism, bus drivers, they're all low-wage service sector jobs, most of them with no benefits. And yet, over the past four years, we've seen a 30% increase in the cost of living. We haven't seen anything in the cost uh, in the way of benefit increases or wage increases that are going to allow those 63% to be able to afford their lifestyle. Here on Guam, without government assistance, it takes $27.60 an hour to provide for the basic needs of a family of four. How many of you have a $27.66 an hour job? Not many. So what do we see in its place? We see people that have two and three jobs, but that's still not enough. So they have SNAP, they have Medicaid, they have Section 8 housing, they have temporary assistance for needy families to help fill that $27.60 gap. The minimum wage we just passed, 50 cents next year, and 50 cents a year later is already eaten up just by the increase in fast food and uh, I don't want to say, I mean just the cost of eating alone. My favorite potato chips have gone from $4.99 to $6.99 and for three and a half ounces. That same bag of potato chips at Walmart is 89 cents. You see, we do have what is known as a paradise tax. We do live in paradise, but it shouldn't be that heavy of a tax. So instead of a meaningful increase in the minimum wage, all the, all the uh, Guam's working poor got was a political increase. Now all the senators are going to run around and they're going to wave their hats. We waive the minimum wage. We're, we're, we're there for you. We're raising the minimum wage. But it didn't do anything. It's not the same thing. So when we look at senators, we have to look at the body of work they've done. And this is Jose Pito Terlahi. His claim to fame is he is a staunch supporter of gambling. He pushed through the gambling legislation, and he did so in such a way to make sure that there were no audit trails and no accountability. Because when they were trying to get the, the gambling put back at the Liberation Carnival, several of us anti-gambling advocates suggested ways that we could, one, make sure government of Guam got the taxes. That never happened. Number two, make sure that we know how much money is going through this casino. That never happened. And as a result, we ended up with a situation where the mayor, members of the Mayor's Council of Guam were actually on the winning bid. And they don't see it as a conflict of interest, that they are the ones that decided who got the concession, and they're on the team. You see, that goes back to that moral hazard of politics that we were talking about. And unless there's a penalty, unless those mayors lose their offices in this election, they will continue to do what they have always done, which is take people for granted. Because gambling is a poor man's tax. People who have money, when they go gamble, they go to Las Vegas, they go to Macau, they go to Monaco. They don't go to uh, a laundromat in Barragata. But that's what we have. We have gaming machines in places where working people go and they're 
cashing in on that desperation. God, if I only can get this one dollar to turn into a hundred, then I could pay half the power bill and maybe they won't turn it off. Maybe if I, this dollar is more lucky. If that dollar's more luckier, I have seen so many people gamble what little disposable income they have out of desperation. The only reason I could live in Reno for seven years is I don't gamble. The only reason Reno has a good casino, has a good gambling economy, is the damage goes home. 98% of the people who lose their money in Las Vegas go home to San Fernando, go to Los Angeles, go to Honolulu and lick their wounds there. And the taxes that the gambling casinos pay in Reno and Las Vegas are more than enough to fund the social services to take care of the local damage. Here we don't even have that. We don't have enough public health or public social service system to take care of the broken families. You go to any game room at 2 o'clock in the morning on a Friday or a Saturday, what are you going to see? You're going to see people in there with their paychecks trying to strike it big. We tried, but now what we have is we have a situation here where we have an administration and a legislature that is friendly to gambling and looking at ways of opening up gambling, and they're all singing the magic song. Well, tax it and use the money for Guam Memorial Hospital. Well, they've been doing that for, let's see, 08? They've been doing it for 10 years. And over 10 years, I believe the only taxes collected have been about 4 million over 10 years, if I'm not mistaken. And the number's probably off, but it's probably even less than 4 million. Because half the money goes to um, the mayor's council. So again, we have a conflict. Why would the mayors want to stop gambling when they get half the money? So the gambling bill was approved for the carnival, and in the process, the carnival lost $200,000. So the gambling wasn't the draw that the mayor's council and those supporting the bill claimed it was going to be. So in addition to losing the revenue and not getting any of the taxes and having to pay the social damages as a result of the gambling, taxpayers are on the hook for $200,000. There's a bill in the legislature right now. Talena Nelson put in, introduced a bill to eliminate the game rooms from the villages. I sent out a letter to all the senators to find out where they stand. Only four senators, well, Talena obviously, but three other senators were the only other senators to respond that they believe that the time has come to terminate gambling operations at the village level because those are 24-7 cash harvesters. You know, you never drive by a game room that's closed and you never drive by a game room that's empty. But what you see, don't see is the carnage caused when people can't pay their power bill, when people can't put their food on the table. It's not a system that Guam is set up for because we're not collecting enough taxes to be able to offset the social problems created by these bills. Now, naturally, the governor is against this bill, and she proved it with her, her, her fervent support for the casino gambling. But here's a perfect example. A business delivery driver stopped in a game room on his way back to work and lost several thousand dollars of collections. That shows how bad this problem is. It's not just affecting families, it's also affecting businesses as well. So, they failed to reduce the cost of government, they failed to uh, roll back the taxes, they failed to collect taxes, they failed to fight crime and make us all feel safer. We do not believe that Guam Memorial is their number one priority and the cost of living in Guam is still going up at double digit rates. So what promises were kept? Can you guys think of any promise that the politicians made coming into this election that were kept? The only one I can think of was recreational marijuana. 
Yeah. So, based on the priorities for this administration and the 35th legislature, there's been a huge divergence between what they said, what they did. Based on the uh, bills that have been heard and passed, their concerns are raising taxes, rescuing Guam Regional, uh, expanding gambling, recreational cannabis, lowering the age of statutory rape, that was one of my favorite public hearings, expanding the size of government, FESPAC, 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 and decolonization. Now you would think that the senators in the 35th legislature would have learned, but they haven't. They've introduced 257 bills, 58 have been passed into law, and they've introduced 259 resolutions commemorating people for 18 years of continuous employment, passing my, my uh, nurse exam, you know. I mean, these are things that, my favorite one though was commemorating the 100th anniversary of the sinking of the Comoran. First of all, who did we give that plaque to? The Germans all drowned. Um, anybody that was around during World War II has pretty much passed on. I've seen resolutions congratulating people on 18 months of continuous employment, congratulating people on 20 years of marriage. You see, by electing public servants, they're going to look at that limited pool of dollars and say, for $800, I could give two resolutions or I could sterilize 40 dogs and make it safer to walk in the villages of Jigo and Dedido. See, it's a question of priorities. For those of you who really want to go to sleep and are having a hard time sleeping, I recommend you download this list, which I will put online every quarter. It's a list of all the bills and have been passed and the votes. Out of these bills right here, 44% 44 44 of the bills were for the benefit of the government. government. Raise the taxes, 5% forever, uh, authorization to do another Hayes study to give employees raises before the 2020 election, uh, uh, give a piece of land from this government agency to that government agency. So those are technical things. And when you look at them, 90% of them could have been done interagency. The legislature is getting involved in way too much stuff. And when you look at the amount of land the legislature zones, we should either shut down Department of Land Management and save ourselves money there. Because I looked at this one map, and there are like 20 lots on it, and it was attached to a bill in the legislature rezoning a residential lot to commercial, and there's like 11 out of the 20 lots had already be rezoned, and it says public law 24, 12, public law 32, you know, all the laws that rezoned all these other lots. 44% was government maintenance, 15, 16% special interest, and only 40% are bills that benefit the public in any way, shape, or form. 40%. That's a pretty low number. So, right now, the priorities of the 35th legislature are preparing for FESPAC. And on top of that, decolonization. Now, they haven't learned their lessons. So far, we've spent three and a half million tax dollars trying to decolonize and we've spent two million on legal fees. So the bill to taxpayers is a little over five million dollars now. But they haven't learned their lesson because they don't want you to be fooled by hybrid decolonization. Status quo is not an option. The reason status quo is not an option is because I did a survey, they refused to, so I did one. 54% are satisfied with the status quo. 24% want closer relationship with the United States. Only 22% want independence. There's only three valid options. Status quo, statehood, or independence. 
This commonwealth is basically status quo. Uh, free association happens after independence, if ever independence ever happens. But they aren't looking at these flaws in the law. So I sent a letter to the Office of the Decolonization Commission pointing out these flaws in the laws. And if you don't fix these flaws in the laws, somebody else might get a wild hair up their ass and file a lawsuit and win. Because the law is still flawed and they haven't learned any lessons from the Davis case. They're still pursuing the same agenda. And as they say in their letter to me, we have no oblig we, we are bound by public law such and such, and therefore we cannot entertain status quo as an option. So I've been trying since October to meet with the head of the uh, decolonization chair, if you will. But she's too busy worrying about CESPAC to worry about recreating legislation to prevent somebody like me filing a lawsuit against the government of Guam and getting millions of dollars in legal fees. She's more concerned about getting the right people into the 100 uh, golden ticket holders for FESPAC. So it's been October uh, since I put them on notice. November, several times I've requested meetings with Senator Marsh Titano. And so far, all I get is an email, we will, we, will, we will be in touch, we will be in touch. Well, here we are going into the new year and we're still not in touch. Here are the only 25 words that matter on this decolonization issue. It was a treaty between Spain and the United States that ceded the territories from Spain to the United States and it says, the civil rights and political status of native inhabitants of the territories hereby ceded to the United States shall be determined by the Congress. Our uh, politicians, about four times a year, like to go to New York because every three months they change the shows and the menus at the five-star restaurants and Broadway. That's the only reason I can think for the pilgrimage, where they go and stand before the United Nations and demand that the United Nations intervene and set our people free to prevent the oceans from rising. And I'm not kidding. It's on my Facebook page. That was one of the justifications for intervention by the United Nations to prevent climate change. Now they've added a new wrinkle to this. They want to go to Belgium. They want membership in the uh, organization to represent unrepresented national peoples. And so they want membership. With membership, I'm sure there's going to be a five or six figure fee. There's going to be quarterly trips to Belgium so that they can alternate between Belgium and the UN. But at the end of the day, it's going to be the US Congress and the fact that our politicians are riding this horse, horse hard. Why? Six-figure jobs, uh, prestigious offices, uh, government paid travel. Why would they want to hold a, 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 a vote? Because if they did a vote, they'd learn the same thing that I learned. 54% are happy with the status quo, 24% want closer relationships. It's hard to build a six-figure job on de decolonization on that message. So based on hundreds of people I've talked to so far, four senators are showing a strong tendency 80% of the time towards public service. And that's uh, Senator Therese Trelawhi, Senator Nelson, Senator Rogel, and Jim Moylan, who I point out is the only elected representative brave enough to come here today. And uh, here's the thing. These people work for us. You would imagine that these people who work for us would be concerned enough about 
how the public views them and their actions that they would be here today. But they're not. And that's their mistake. Because what we get to do every two years is overthrow the government. We've done it twice so far. If you think back to 2016, we knocked out six very strong, powerful incumbents over the pay raise issue. 2018, a lot of them who were on the bubble left because they knew they were not going to make it. Now we're coming up on 2020 and we have a bunch of new people in, but not all of them have yet learned who their true masters are. So they have between now and the primary election to show that 80% of their effort is for public service. We can't get rid of the politics completely, but there are a number of things that I as a voter am upset about, and this is just me personally. We elected 15 senators, right? 15 senators we elected. But when the party in power cuts the minority senators out of the process, they're basically taking a crap on our vote. They're saying your vote for those people didn't matter. So unless they're an insider, they're not gonna get a committee, they're not gonna get any bills heard. And that's why we're seeing the same old crap happen year after year, and that's on us. We need to be more aggressive about who we give our precious vote, who we put into positions of power and authority to speak in our name and to write checks in our name. Yes. The, on the what? The, the cemetery in PD? All right. My take on this is every family on Guam has one or more veterans. I am proud to say that my dad served, my, two of my uncles served. So three out of my five uh, greatest generation members served. Three of my brothers served. Six of my cousins served. And right now, I'm going to, I'm going to go on a limb. I'd say right now at this point in time, we have probably about somewhere between 11 and 15 of the nieces and nephews in uniform right now. I don't know a single family on Guam that does not have multiple veterans in their family tree. I think the local veterans office is very poorly run and I blame it on the veterans and I'll tell you why. Because they have the same power and vote and authority as I have. I have been, I'm at the legislature all the time. I'm in senators' faces all the time. I'm in the governor's faces all the time. I'm drafting legislation. I'm filing lawsuits. Because that is my right as a citizen, and I'm standing up for a narrow range of causes. I think the veterans, if they wanted to, could be one of the most powerful forces for good on this island, but they need to stand up and serve the people much in the way they serve the service. Because I think that cemetery is a, it's a shame. I was just there recently for a burial. And we're, we're burying a veteran We've got a backhoe 25 feet away digging another grave during a very solemn ceremony. Now, why couldn't that, that grave have been dug after the ceremony or before the ceremony or the following day? But to act, I mean, literally, just as we were taking the coffin out of the hearse, you, they fire up the backhoe and you get that, you know, they're breaking their neck. <laughs> And then through the entire ceremony, we had that vroom, vroom, through the entire ceremony. You see, 
That is disrespect. Whoever's running that office needs to do a better job making sure that the solemn rituals of our veterans are respected and honored. That place is a solemn place. It needs to be respected and honored. And a few times that I've gone there, I have seen evidence of neglect. And that bothers me. But, you know, I'm, I'm fighting the governor. I'm fighting the legislature. I was fighting Guam YTK, Guam Resource Recovery Partners, Simon Sang. I mean, there's so many things that we've been fighting that I haven't been able to stand up, and I want to. I want to take the lessons I've learned running a community advocate operation and have the veterans follow the same blueprint because my brothers are veterans. My, well, my dad and uncles are gone, but my brothers and my cousins are all veterans, and they don't know what to do, you know? And so someone needs to take charge and... I would have thought if there was any organization that could organize itself and make a powerful influence on this government, it would be the people who fought for this government and fought for this island, fought for this people. I have nothing but respect for veterans because I never served. I, I tried to enlist too late. The Vietnam War was winding down and I was 26. And the Marines were not taking anybody 26 or older at the time I tried to, re tried to enlist. I'm 65. Well, this is an organizational problem that I'm hoping that the veterans on this Guam will realize what their true power is. Because if a group, how many of you remember Guamanians for Fair Government? You know, if Guam Citizens for Public Accountability and Guamanians for Fair Government can knock out six of the most powerful politicians in the 32nd legislature, what could a well-organized group of veterans with the skills they've developed and honed over the years if they just got their act together and made, made it a mission. Because my brother, it's all about a mission. It's funny. He doesn't mow the lawn. He's got a mission. <laughs> you know, he gets his equipment out and like that, you know. But the thing is, you guys are great. You guys run places where everybody's running away from. You guys put your lives on the line with your John Hancock. When I joined a uh, insurance company, I didn't risk anything, you know, but friends of mine who were in the service, they went to places like Mogadishu, the Balkans, the Middle East, you know, they're, they're retiring out now, you know, and I, I just want to say that our family has also taken casualties, as many of your families have, in these wars as well. And so that's why I, I'm, I wish I could be as active for veterans as I was for school children, government employees, the working poor, um, you know, taxpayers. But, you know, there's, I, have to, I, I have to box myself a little bit, and I'm hoping that someone in the veterans community will develop the kind. I keep trying. I'm talking to veterans. I'm trying to get them. When we elect senators, senators screen all the appointments made by the administration and confirm them. The exception is boards and commissions. The governor appoints people to the boards and commissions, the legislature confirms the members of the boards and commissions, and the boards and commissions then 
go behind the curtain and say, hey, we like Gregory Spichow. Let's give him $170,000 a year as his first job outside of politics. And there's no oversight. The local VA office. Uh, I'm not happy with it, but I'm not a veteran. But if enough veterans went to the governor's office and said, we're mad as hell, we don't want this person anymore, we want something that can pour piss out of a boot without having to read the instructions that are printed on the bottom. That would happen. I mean, look what's happened to the Department of Corrections. Anonymous letters, boom, the director's gone. And who do you hold, who do you hold accountable for that? No. Who's the politician that brought him out? And what have you said to MSN about this? Well, you see, that's the whole point. You see, politicians here on Guam are not used to getting pushback from citizens. When I worked in the legislature, if a senator got four phone calls, there was a staff meeting. You know, we got four phone calls on this issue. What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? You know, those senators should be getting hundreds of phone calls and emails on things like gambling, uh, Guam Memorial Hospital, health care costs, road construction projects. You know, they raised the fuel taxes on us twice, and they're trying to appropriate, I think, three or four million dollars more for public works because the money that's going into the fuel taxes is being used for things like paying for the uh, public administration building at UOG and you know, things like that. Uh, paying the mayor's offices for their island beautification program. Huh? Oh, yeah, don't forget the strawberry festival, very important. But you see, when we, as citizens, step up, and remember Einstein's theory of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results, we need to look at a different rule. I call it the 50-50 rule. When we elect a new face to the legislature, we have a 50-50 chance that person is going to be a public servant or a politician. If we change politicians often enough and fast enough, then pretty soon we will have a legislature, the most powerful house of government, the part of government that creates the laws and the part of government that funds the government and creates the taxes. If we get enough public servants, and that requires us to be brave, when you see Mark Diego, and you say, who the hell is he? Vote for him. Because you know who he isn't? He's not Tina Munya Barnes, who had never met a pork barrel project she didn't like. She's not uh, Pito Terlahi, who is bound and determined to make sure gambling is our new uh, economy. These are the things that we must do as citizens and voters because when we start invoking the 50-50 rule, in four years we will have a majority, a supermajority, ten public servants in the legislature. Of course the parties aren't going to like that because the parties like controlling the game. That's why they're introducing more laws to tighten their control. That's why I'm doing a voter initiative process to weaken their control. Because later on this next year, you, there's gonna be a vote. Ballots going around to eliminate the primary election, which breaks party control, to raise the number of senators to 21 and make it a part-time legislature. So with 21 part-time senators, and we eliminate party control, then we'll finally get the kind of government we as citizens deserve. You see, the most important office of all is private citizen. We have all the power, but only if we use it. This is what the game should look like. We should have politicians running scared coming this election. Why? They all made promises they did not keep. Unless we hold them accountable for not keeping their promises, they're only going to lie to us again. 
So we have to make it, make it teach politicians that their word is their most sacred tool. If they're going to say X, they better by God do everything in their power to make X happen. And if they fail, we as taxpayers will have known they tried. But when they promise to do all these things, get into power and do absolutely none of them and don't make any attempt to do any of them, and we return any of those politicians back to office, it's shame on us. Because right now it's very easy to track who is naughty, who is nice. And all it is is we have to look at the types of legislation they introduce and what bills they vote for. Because every single one of the senators voted for Bill 30. Now, that alone does not justify eliminating all of them if through successive votes and successive pieces of legislation they've introduced, we see that the, the majority of the work they've done, and I'm saying 80%, that's my standard, 80% of the bills they introduce are for the benefit of the people. That is somebody worth returning to office. But when 80% of the bills they introduce are for government or for pork barrel consideration, those are people we can do without. We have four years to save our island, and I'll tell you why. Right now, we have a debt bomb that's ticking away. We have $5 billion of debt on this island. We have, four, we have an economy that's $5 billion. So we're almost 100% leveraged. If we have a typhoon come through here, we have a, a, I mean, look at what happened with dengue fever. We didn't have a, a plague or an epidemic. We just had cases. But we had a lot of cases considering we never had any for 75 years. What if the measles breaks out here like it is in Samoa? Right now in American Samoa, they got 4,000 cases of measles and about 60 deaths, and the majority of the deaths are in children. What if something like that happens here? We have an escalating health care crisis. All the chronic diseases are blowing up. How many of you know some? Don't raise your hands. Everybody in this room has somebody in their family that's diabetic or type 2 diabetic. Everybody in this room has somebody in their family that has cardiac problems, cancer, or high blood pressure. Everybody. These numbers here on Guam are going up at double-digit rates, but at the same time, the administration and the legislature are gutting our public health care system. Why? That $31 million that went to health care premiums, is not going to actual health care. That's why we need to rethink the problem and put the people of this island first on every major issue. Crime, we need more police officers. What did we get, 10? Didn't they just hire 10? But they're talking about 180 people to facilitate the buildup, and I don't understand that because all the plans and engineering and permitting are going to go through NAVFAC. They're not going to go through DPW. Uh, all the work is going to be done inside the base, so I don't understand why we need to hire 189 people to facilitate the buildup when we've had close to $800 million of buildup already happen with our existing government of Guam levels. Our economy is shrinking. I am worried that we're going to see a ripple in this economy that is going to slow down everything. Because right now, Korea is edging down. Japan is edging down towards recession. Thailand, in India, Philippines, Australia, Indonesia, Malaysia are already in recession. What happens to our tourist economy when South Korea goes into recession. They've only lost about 300,000 jobs so far this year. What happens to South Korea or Japan go into recession? What happens here on Guam? Hey, we've just passed a $954 million budget. What could go wrong? Yeah. Yeah, I can, I can use anecdotal information. His question is good. 
we've had a stealth buildup. We've had $800 million worth of construction over the past five years, 800 million. And we haven't seen anything outside the fence because the majority of that income is companies that are based inside the fence or joint venture projects with companies inside the fence. When I attended the NAVFAC briefings, they said that, remember, this is when we were expecting 30,000 Marines on Guam. They said that if the full 30,000 moved to Guam, 98% of the jobs will transfer from Okinawa to Guam. They were projecting a local hire of between 400 and 700 new jobs created as a result of the 30,000 man buildup. Well, now we're down to an 8,000 man buildup, but still, any of the jobs created are gonna come from there. What have we seen in the stealth buildup? We've seen a dramatic increase in the cost of rentals. Why? Because the military personnel, their cost of living allowances keep going up, and when their cost of living allowances go up, they have more money to spend on rentals. Anecdotal information, I know a guy had a duplex in Jigo. He was renting it out five years ago for 700 a side, you know, two bedroom, two bath. So he got creative, borrowed 18,000, made it a three bedroom, two bath, upgraded the cabinets and the air conditioners, and he was renting them out for 2,500 a month. Where do you think the two families that were paying 700 a month had to move to? So we're seeing an increase in the cost of living as a result of the stealth buildup, and we will see it continue as the buildup continues because as more people come into the bases and they start moving out, they're going to drive up the cost of rentals and we're going to drive uh, people out of the... If you don't already own your house now, you're not going to be able to own a house. That's how it's getting. Right now, I'm looking at listings that are in the 300,000 range. A friend of mine sent me a clip of a, an affordable housing project in Hawaii with one bedroom unit starting at 754,000. See, in Hawaii, if I was making $100,000 a year, family of four, I qualify for housing assistance. We're getting there on Guam because our politicians are not looking at how they can serve the people because if they, could, if they were serving the people, if we had a 2,000 increase in r rental units, guess what would happen to the prices of rentals? They'd start coming down. So it's all geared to what is best for those with the closest ties to the administration, not necessarily what is best for the rest of us. 63% of our people live and work in low-wage service sector jobs. 34% of our people are on Medicaid. 36% of our people are on food stamps. 11% of our people are on Section 8 housing. Does that sound like the kind of economy that we can have a billion dollar budget on? No. So it comes back down to us. This election, we look at those who supported the people, we return them to office. Those who did not support the people, we vote them out of office, and we look at every new name, and we know that we got a 50% chance of picking a winner. So let me ask you, if I told you you could go to Las Vegas and you could have a 50% chance of winning on every single bet you made, how many bets would you make? Yeah. You see, we have a 50% chance of getting a winner. And those are the kinds of odds I like. Because if we vote for the same people we've always voted for, we have no chance at returning the power of the people to the legislature. So let's take a risk. Here we have a politically well-known well insider, pork dispenser, champion gambling uh, advocate. Here we have a guy whose claim to fame is he, he drove a, a, a tank in the army and he's out and this is his first attempt at public office since he retired. Go for the new guy because we have a 50% chance in two years 
of having 10 public servants in this body. And with a supermajority of public servants, that's the only way we have a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. I want to thank you all very much. Anybody has any questions? I'm still here. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Remember, this election, we have a chance to take our power back and really have a chance to make positive changes for this island. Because if we don't do it by 2022, then we're going to be in a lot of trouble. Thank you.